In my last video, we covered the first day on a regular weekend Christmas extravaganza in Moscow. We saw the Nikolskaya shopping district behind Red Square, the Pashkov Mansion and Pushkin Museum, both the old and new Arbots, the Christ the Savior Cathedral, and even took in the views over some of the historic and beautiful sites of Moscow from over the Moscow River. But that was only day one of a weekend series that I'm trying to do to show you what Christmas in Moscow can offer you. So let's try and get you into the spirit of the season. Waking up the next morning, we wanted to retread our steps a little bit and head back over to the Pashkov Mansion. And from there, we headed down an adjacent street a little bit further on to see the Sholokhov Park and Museum. Sholokhov was a Nobel Prize winning author best known for his epic work on the Cossacks during the Russian Revolution called And Quiet Flows the Dawn. The author grew up amongst Cossack people, a sort of Slavic cowboy group. And his life was crazy. He was one of the only people to tell Stalin to his face about the real state of collective farms and how bad they were turning out because he lived in a rural part of the country where all of this terrible stuff was happening. Stalin even replied to his accusations of two Soviet officials torturing local farmers by sending the police to investigate. The police found the officials guilty and sentenced them to death, which is probably the most Stalin-like thing in both a good and a bad way. Another time, Sholohov was meaning to accept an international award for literature somewhere abroad, but on the eve of the event, he refused to go unless his friends who were wrongfully imprisoned were released. Stalin, shockingly, did just that. His titular book is oddly anti-revolutionary, which for me is an interesting fact as not only did Stalin allow its circulation, but he enjoyed the book himself, which should tell you how good the book actually is. Now to honor this author, there's a park and a museum dedicated to his honor. And it's the perfect place to get some coffee and have a decorated stroll on a brisk Moscow morning before you head off to our next site through the metro station about an hour away, we are going to Videnha. This famous park is always at the top of most people's to-do lists here in Moscow along with the Kremlin. The name Videnha is actually an abbreviation for its full name, the Exhibition of Achievements of National Economy. Now that sounds boring, but I promise I had no idea it actually had anything to do with the economy when I was there. For most people in modern day Russia, it's a historic and beautiful park, twice as much so in winter. It has the Moskvarium, which I went to last year and made a video about. You can check the comments if you guys are interested in seeing what that was like. It also houses this iconic statue that anyone who has ever seen a Tarkovsky film or really any Soviet movie or cartoon probably recognizes. It's the icon from Moss film. This statue is called the Worker and the, and I'm gonna mess this up, Kolkhoz Woman. It's a symbol of the Soviet Union and was featured in the 1937 World's Fair before finding its final platform here next to the park. Then adjacent to that is another iconic feature of the Denha, the Museum of Cosmonautics, which juts out of the sky in a way that's really hard to describe on film. This museum from the outside is more like a skyscraper than some boring history excursion. And that's almost fitting because this place carries 85,000 items, all the way from the origins of the space race through modern missions and the International Space Station. The museum claims it has over 300,000 visitors annually, so I can see why this is a must-see. I personally know that I learned so much about Russia just from this one museum alone. In my high school history courses, we barely touched on anything in the space race. And the only thing I knew about Russian space was the word Sputnik. But the advancements that Russians contributed to space worldwide is absolutely worthy of its own museum. After purchasing a ticket for a couple of bucks, you'll be given the chance to see hundreds of exhibits and even try some vending machine space food packets if you're into that sort of thing. But I decided to pass and head on to the rest of the museum where you can actually see the original Sputnik satellite, the first satellite in space ever, as well as, well, meet Belka and Strelka, the first living creatures to orbit in space and return safely. Behind them, you can see the development of space travel as each iteration of dogship became more and more advanced and technical. To that end, I surprisingly found out that out of 57 dogs the Soviets sent into space, 
It was rare that one died. Most of these deaths weren't planned and were due to technical difficulties or malfunctions rather than planned abuse. And according to the museum, there was only one dog, Laika, that had an expected death during his only trip to the great beyond. Godspeed, good boy. Godspeed. Another fact about dogs in space is that most of these dogs were homeless dogs that they found around Moscow. They had to be a certain size to fit the equipment, so when scientists were driving around Moscow and saw a homeless dog that roughly fit the description, they would take them and train them and treat them like kings, and when they returned, they would be national heroes. Weirdly enough, some of the puppies from Belka and Strelka were even gifted to the Kennedys by Khrushchev in 1961. Once you've walked around a little bit longer, you probably will see the focal point of the entire museum. It's incredibly hard to miss. You'll be greeted by the great Soviet hero and heartthrob himself, Yuri Gagarin. This guy was truly bigger than Jesus, despite what the Beatles would say during the Soviet Union. I was even told a funny story where my friend's mother was completely convinced she was going to marry him. He was the heartthrob of the Soviet Union, and when she found out that he got married without her, she was heartbroken. Yuri was the first human to journey into outer space and receive the nation's highest honor they can give out, the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal. He broke record after record in cosmonautics, but he tragically died in just a regular plane crash at the age of 34. You can see how important he was to the country by how robust his funeral was. Many of his personal belongings are in this museum, which is probably why I felt more of a sense of connection to him than I did only reading about him. Now that's just the Soviet part of the museum. There's a whole modern area that is twice that size. Some of my favorite things to do is you can go inside the various spacecrafts yourself and take tours around and see how the Russian cosmonauts lived in space. Another really interesting thing that I saw was a diorama where a space crew returned and crashed in Siberia, and they had to survive with only a very interesting looking gun that they had, until the Russian government could go find them in Siberia. This museum taught me so much about the pride of a people who raced the world to the heavens and actually did it. From poor, uneducated serfs to the first people in space within 40 years certainly would make me proud of my people too. By now, when we left, it's probably going to be dark because the sun goes down around 3 p.m. in the winter, so we better not waste any more time and get going to our final destination, the main complex of Videnha. Built in 1935, this park has a pavilion for each member state of the former Soviet Union. The exterior show off their unique architectural and cultural contribution to the Soviet Union, and inside it describes how each member of the Soviet Union developed, sacrificed, and helped the Union become what it was. This was so that every citizen of the Soviet Union when they came to Moscow could go in and see themselves represented, walk inside and see what they're contributing and how it matters and how much their sacrifice is helping, as well as go to all the other countries and see how their sacrifices, how their contributions are contributing for a dream that almost was. Nowadays, this park is much less about these historical exhibits and more about the beauty of the park this time of season, which is why it's my final destination on my Moscow Christmas weekend. It's illuminated as if it's the gem in the crown of Moscow. Not to be outdone by the rest of the world during Christmas time, this park also contains the largest ice skating rink, not only in Russia, but of all Europe. Totaling 60,000 square meters or 645,000 square feet if you use freedom units, it can hold up to 4,500 skaters at any one time. And walking around it, walking over the bridges, probably is the most magical feeling I've ever felt at Christmas time in any country that I've been in. So for you, dear viewer, why don't you strap up your skates while I finish my epilogue? Moscow at Christmas time is one of those places that if you just remove your preconceptions for a moment and try to look at it unbiasedly, she will utterly surprise you. She will teach you, she will entertain you, and she will astound you with her beauty and history. 
As for me, I have one more video this year before I take my annual Christmas vacation from YouTube, so I hope you will consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel so you can catch what lies next in this wintry series. I wish you all a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year wherever you are and whatever you celebrate. I'll be thinking about you, and I hope you'll be thinking about me too.